Well, I know that Texas, uh, when Governor Bush was there, oh, the good old days. We've all <laughs> overcome our governor issues, I think, <laughs> or we're trying. Um, when he was there, there was a man who was mentally retarded, who was on death row, and I, I'm not saying that satirically, yeah. okay. And he had this amazingly low IQ, and the Supreme Court finally had to step in and stop that uh, because he wouldn't give a stay of execution and hear this man's crying because they're taking away his, his last meal and doesn't understand that means he won't die. I mean, this is, this is just, it's really uh, barbaric. And not, and not just to the people. I mean, there, there is that and the innocence questions. But I know people that work in the prisons here. I know uh, a, a lot of different people here. And I can't imagine anyone that I would want them to go to work one day and have to pull those levers that put poison into someone and kill them, regardless of what that person had done. I mean, that, that seems to me just like if that's your job, uh, you should go back, find your guidance counselor, <laughs> and do some damage. Maybe be the next one. Um, why, why is this, uh, Rich, you're, you're so involved in this in Alaska. We haven't had the death penalty here for a long time. There's certainly the, um, you know, the reapers that are out there that really want this back. Tell me about why you got involved in this. Why is this important? Well, I moved up from Ohio in 1987, and I, I tried death penalty cases back in Ohio before I moved up here. And ironically, I moved up here since so I wouldn't have to do any more death penalty cases. Mm -hmm. Then I went to the federal uh, defender office where we do have death cases. And uh, so you know, I know it firsthand, and there's so many arguments uh, against it that I know of uh, you know, the religious, uh, you know, the New Testament, the cost, expen uh, the expense of it, every study in every state that has a death penalty it's more expensive. The innocence, uh, you know, Curtis McCarty is a good argument just in himself and there's been over 130 people who've been on death row convicted by a jury who were exonerated. Um, and we've had six or seven of them come to Alaska to speak to people. So uh, it's those people who know the death penalty firsthand, not just as some kind of uh, abstract you know, theory of vengeance that uh, no, it doesn't work, and it's immoral, and it's expensive, and um, and we we convict innocent people, which is I think probably one of the biggest crimes I could think of. Well, and how many how many people have been innocent and put to death? Even if there's one, mm -hmm. that one was somebody, somebody, mm -hmm. and that person. Can you imagine laying there waiting for this this? drug to hit your heart knowing you didn't do it. And I, I just that I, I just can't be part of that system. I can't well, think Justice that that's Scalia, what we do. Justice Scalia has said that if there was ever proof of an innocent person actually being executed, we should get on the rooftops and scream the injustice. And just this last year there was proof that a person in Texas was uh, executed and he was innocent. And so, you know, we should all be screaming on from the rooftops about that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think right now, uh, Mike Chenault is bringing this up in the state of Alaska. Um, Mike. <laughs> Look right I did. Um, you know, he is, uh, he's just on the wrong side of a lot of things. And he actually said this, I don't think I have the votes for it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Well, it's an election year. And you've got to get the, it's red meat to red voters. It just, it is. And, and it's ironic to me because it's not a conservative thing to spend all this money to put to death people that may or may not be innocent. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just really outrageous. And that's one of the realities. It's a political uh, motivation that uh, brings the death penalty to states and keeps it in states. and. Uh, Although the recent trend has been to abolish it in a number of states, but uh, it's a Oh, and we're bringing it back. <laughs> well, I don't think we are what bringing are, it back. What are, how many years behind can we possibly be? <laughs> I mean, I know you have to like go through another country to get here sometimes, <laughs> but really, like, Jeez. we're really? we're kind of behind the mark here. Uh, I want to talk about recidivism rates when we come back from the break, and and is the prison system really working? You know, some more uh, questions about what we're doing here in Alaska because. Um, that's part of the reason, I think, that some people really argue for the death penalty. Uh, so we'll be right back. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, all right. All right. Well.
Welcome back. Uh, I'm Shannon Moore, and this is Warrant North, and I'm really glad you're joining us. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really glad our panel's here, Susan Orlansky, uh, Rich Kurtner, and Bill Pelkey. And I want to talk to you a little bit about recidivism and what, why this doesn't, why our system isn't really quite working, why people are, you know, coming in and out of prisons, and eventually, you know, I don't know the, the rotating door that we have. We're not treating people for addictions or for whatever. And they're coming out and it's costing us more money. We could definitely save some money with that. But um, Bill, I want to ask you, you, you wrote a book, Journey of Hope, From Violence to Healing. And your, your grandmother being um, murdered by four young girls. I can't really imagine uh, a lot that's more horrific. For your family to go through this sort of violence is really horrible. And this you know, thirst for vengeance, this, you, I, you would so, I would so much want to get that back. And I understand, I do not know the story, but I understand you had an epiphany and I want to hear about this epiphany. Because if I can go through your epiphany and learn what okay. you have uh, without having to go through your lesson, I'd, I'd like that. Okay. Uh, it was November 2nd, 1986. It was about a year and a half after my grandmother's death. About, a, about three and a half months after the girl had been on death row for killing my grandma. 15 years old. She was 15 years old at the time of the murder. Um, and it's kind of a long story, but I'll try to give you the, the real short version. But I became convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that my grandmother would have been appalled by the fact that this girl was on death row and that so many people want her to die. I was convinced she would have had love and compassion for this girl and for this girl's family. And I felt she wanted me to also have that same sort of love and compassion. Uh, I knew from my faith bringing that forgiveness was always the right thing, but compassion was another story I didn't have a bet. But so convinced of what my grandmother would have wanted, I begged my God to please, please give me love and compassion for Paula Cooper and her family and do that on behalf of my grandmother. It was just a short prayer. And I began to think, well, I could write this girl a letter. I could tell her about my grandmother, share my grandmother's faith. And I realized the prayer of compassion had been answered because I knew I no longer want her to die. I wanted to do whatever I could do to try to help her. And I learned the most important lesson of my life that night. That was about the healing power of forgiveness. Because when my heart was touched with compassion, forgiveness took place. And that forgiveness brought a tremendous healing. For a year and a half after my grandmother's death, whenever I thought about her, I pictured her butchered on the dining room floor. The dining room where our family went every year for Thanksgiving, Easter, and birthdays, happy twice occasions. And to think about her butchered on that dining room floor tore me apart, as well as other members of my family. But my heart was touched with compassion and forgiveness took place. I immediately knew that from that moment on, whenever I thought about my grandmother again, I would no longer picture how she died but a picture of how she lived, what she stood for, what she believed in, the beautiful, wonderful person she was. And I knew something special had happened inside of me. And it wasn't something that happened just so I'd feel good for a period of time, but it's something to be shared with other people. But I learned that I did not have to see somebody else die in order to bring healing from my grandmother's death. And that's what murder victim family members need. They need healing. They don't need to see somebody else die. Well, I think that's, that's such a remarkable story that you went through this. And I think so many times when we look at different issues like the death penalty, um, I, I have an opinion about it. And people will, will say to me, or, or I have an opinion about torture, or I have an opinion about the First Amendment. And the First Amendment's really important when people say thing you, things you don't like. And torture, you know, unless you're in some 24 s scenario, you know, people will, would call into the show and say, well, what if they had your daughter? What if this? What if that? And, um, and, and I would say, no, no I, I hope that I still am able to have my principles. And the fact that you've come to this place and realized how, um, how important that is and what that really uh, families that have gone through this need. So the young woman who, young woman, Judas Priest, she was a girl. She should have been at the mall, not stabbing your grandmother, for God's sake. So she's in, 
she's in prison, she's on death row. What happened to her? Have you had contact with her? And, and what is, I'm assuming she's still in prison. What is? Uh, well, short version is uh, after three years, she was uh, taken off of death row by the state of Indiana, commuted to 60 years in prison. Indiana, you have to do half of that on good behavior, you get out. So it makes it 30 years. Since she got out of uh, death row, she got her GED and a college degree through correspondence courses. So she'll actually get out a little bit earlier. She's scheduled to be released in January of 2014. And I plan to beat her at the gate to meet her when she gets out. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, people talk, and you're actually doing the walk. And I really, I can't even tell you what, how much more that means than anybody getting up and preaching about what they think things should be. You're living it. And I, I appreciate you sharing that with us.